Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes, my name is Phoenix. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the shadows and you enjoy what you are hearing, please make sure to tickle that subscribe button and also tickle his best friend the notification bell. Make sure you set that one to all that way you are reminded of every time I upload a video which tends to be daily. With that being said, congratulations to Back to Ashes this whole channel because it took an army to get to where we are today. Back to Ashes just hit 20,000 subscribers and I can only send out 20,000 thank yous. This vocal melatonin must be addictive. <laughs> so here's to 20 more. Thank each and every last one of you for supporting the channel. Now, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Backwood Creepy Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad, or read the first story, there will be an ad, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I live in a part of Texas with dense forests. My friend and I were in middle school and enjoyed exploring at night. We learned that the drainage pipe on the side of the road was big enough for us to crouch through, so we hopped in and started walking, leaving markers to guide our way back. After 30 minutes to an hour of walking, we popped out of the manhole that landed us in the middle of nowhere, deep into the woods. We kept walking until we came across an abandoned two-story cabin. No road leading up to it. No means of accessing the cabin by vehicle. What could be argued as the front lawn was littered with half-buried toys, all of them looking very old in design. Plenty of porcelain dolls were buried in the yard. The windows were too dirty to see inside, so we broke a window with a rock to get inside. What could have been furniture at one point in time had rotted away so that only iron frames remained. The floor of the cabin was completely covered in old empty oil cans, the kind you see in 50s cartoons. We couldn't go upstairs because the staircase had collapsed from rot. So we left and started making our way back to the manhole we came in from. As we were walking away, I took a look back at the cabin. In the window of one of these second-story rooms, I swear to God I saw a child staring back at me. He looked to be about eight to ten years old and had short, straight black hair. I am convinced that I saw a ghost that day. I've never been a big fan of camping. Circa 2012, for some reason or another, my friend and I decided to take a Saturday night to camp on private property. We had permission from the owner. On the bank of a small lake in the rural American Southeast. The lake wasn't very large, probably only 50 to 150 yards across. Not great at estimating distance, sorry. It was more of a deep pond, but it was five times as long as it was wide, and from the perspective of our camp, it consumed the majority of our sight line. The plot of land itself wasn't entirely removed from civilization. We were five to 10 miles outside of a small suburb of a mid-sized Southern city. It definitely was not easy to access, however, and the only way in was a gated, narrow dirt road across a levee which spanned one side of the lake. This road was gated and locked. The owner gave us the code. We pulled the car through and locked the gate behind us. If you've ever been down south, you know how quickly it gets isolated outside of cities. Our city was small and the rural people around often live rough and wild. We have dense woods, so thick that they're not worth building in unless you have some connection or attachment to the area. I've heard it was not profitable to cut roads through, 
A lot of it when they were building highways in the 50s, so not much development has happened in the last hundred years, and, in some places, since the Civil War. It's not uncommon to go for a 30-minute drive straight out of town and come upon cabins that are obviously off the grid. My friend and I were used to living in the suburbs, so we were just happy to see stars and hear the sounds of nature. We were at our very utilitarian camp, small Coleman two-person tent and a blanket, simply looking around and enjoying the night, when suddenly my buddy sat up real straight. He said something like, Do you see that guy over there? He pointed to the other side of the small lake. I didn't see anything. I sat up slightly and said, Nah, it's just the dark playing tricks on you, man. He seemed actually shaken. N no, look, there's a bunch of faces behind the trees now. That got my attention, and I sat up fully, rubbing my eyes to try to gain full focus. And then I saw them. Small, round, white faces stared back at me from across the lake. Maybe 15 to 20 of them. All were positioned in such a way that their bodies were beyond the trees and only their heads were visible. The best way I can describe the faces is like very pale, somehow internally illuminated children. I should mention that neither of us were drinking or high. We were just too young for that. Not for at least a few more years. We had eaten dinner at home and were just planning on going to sleep after chilling out for a while. The faces weren't moving. I was kind of sitting there in shock, thinking that my eyes would adjust and I would see that they were a reflection, bugs or owls or something. But I could never come to that realization. I stared right back at them for what felt like five minutes, looked back at my friend, and then they were gone. Bodies of water carry sound extremely well, and we heard extensive shuffling from the other side of the lake, and a couple of small branches snap. It's incredible what your eyes pick up on during an otherwise silent night. My buddy was tearing up a little when he said, What the hell were those? And I didn't have a good answer. Neither of us slept particularly well. I definitely felt validated in my feelings of disliking camping. But what were we going to do? I tried to do some research on the internet, but never found a phenomenon that could explain what we saw. I'm not a professional, and we weren't all that deep into the Point Reyes trail system, but we had a pretty creepy experience nonetheless. I was camping with a bunch of city dwellers who had never done a hike in camping trip before. Needless to say, some things didn't go so well, like two people only bringing one small bottle of water, several people bringing insufficient food, and one couple that were carrying an eight-man tent between them. It was like herding cats, let me tell you what. Anyway, we finally make camp. Maybe 2 to 2.30? We're up on the cliffs and have a beautiful view. We have ample time to set up camp, cook dinner, tell ghost stories, etc. But no, these numb nuts get the bright idea to go down to the water. It's just right there, they plead. 30 minutes tops. This is bullshit. It's easily a two hour hike down. I know this. One other guy knows this, but we feel obligated to go with these yahoos to keep them out of trouble. We get to the beach while the sun is setting. Now, we have to hike back in the deepening dark. There's a dim moon and the fog is rolling in. I have the only flashlight and the batteries give out after a while. Of course we got lost and I managed to take a spill, twisting my ankle pretty damn badly. So it's dark. Fog has visibility down further. We're lost cold, hungry, and I'm injured. 
Then, the other competent hiker pulls me aside and tells me, in hushed, urgent tones, I don't want to freak the others out, but something is following us back there. It comes into view and then fades back into the fog. I've never seen anything like it. As we continue on, I catch sight of a ghostly white shape, maybe three feet tall, moving silently but quickly alongside the trail we were on. Every hair on my body stood on end, and I could have made a diamond in my ass. It didn't stay visible for long and disappeared into the brush almost as soon as I noticed it. I caught fleeting sight of it again twice more before it disappeared for good. To this day, I have no idea what it was. I never saw it for long enough or clearly enough to make even an uneducated guess. It did not move like any animal I'm familiar with or know was in that park. I can't tell you how relieved I was when we got above the fog and the visibility, though it's still darker than Satan's asshole illuminated by a sickly candle quadrupled. At midnight, we called for a halt. We rested for about half an hour, pulled what little food and water we had left and tried to figure out where we were. When we got started up again, we literally took 10 steps and turned a bend straight into our tents. We still tell stories about how delicious the crunchy spaghetti was that I made for everyone, one bowl at a time that night. Honestly, I was making it so I would have an excuse to stand next to the fire, hoping that whatever it was out there would be afraid of it. Oh, and a bonus event. Later that night or morning, I was woke by something underneath the tent, pushing hard into my back. I believe I screamed and scrambled out of my sleeping bag and out of the tent without ever passing through the space between those two points. I peered back into the tent and could see my sleeping bag jump in a rhythmic motion. I landed on the mound with my elbow and proceeded to punch the ever-living shit out of it. When the sleep grogginess dissipated, I assumed it was a gopher, but I was taking zero chances after that Eve's misadventures. This was the single most terrifying moment of my life, and I had been to Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm sorry if my storytelling skills suck. It's just something that has always stuck with me. I have a cousin that lives in a secluded area where everyone owns land. He has something like 600 acres of land where he lets his cattle run free. I went to visit him one summer and he came up with the idea of camping out. He has a little spot where there is a teepee and a clearing underneath the large trees. The walking path goes straight through the clearing down to a little trail to a pond, then goes back up into some trees. To get to this place, we drove his truck through his pasture and up to a tree line. We had to get out and walk a ways into the trees to get there. Thinking back on it, I can't really remember how far into the tree line his camping site was, but it was a little bit of a walk. So, it's my cousin, his girlfriend, a friend she brought, and myself. We start to drink and had a small campfire going. Someone threw a little too much brush on the fire and it got pretty big, to the point that it lit some of the branches of the trees above on fire. It was kind of scary at that point, thinking we almost started a huge fire, but it grew and then died pretty quickly. Now. Later on in the night, we were all drinking, and I'm tending to the fire. The girlfriend says out loud that she needs to use the restroom, and I thought that she went down the path near the pond. The fire is starting to die down, and I need to gather some more brush, so I started walking towards the path to the pond. As I'm walking down the path, I see a shadow of someone holding a tree branch up seemingly looking back at me. 
Remembering that the girlfriend had announced that she needed to use the restroom, I assumed it was her, so I call out her name. As soon as I do, the shadow drops the tree branch and I can no longer see it. At that same moment, I hear the girlfriend shout back at me from the campsite. I look back and from a distance, I could see her coming out of the teepee. I look back at the brush and I see nothing. I stare for a moment, but there was no movement. Completely shocked and confused, I start to walk back to the camp, heart already pacing so fast I thought I might pass out. When I walk up to the camp, I see that all of us are there. I tell them what just happened and everyone is a little freaked out. My cousin brushes it off saying we're out on his land and there's no way anyone could be out there. We eventually keep drinking, but I cannot forget about it. Much later on, I'm getting a little tired and my cousin is looking to fool around with his girlfriend, so we all lay down in the teepee. I am laying next to the friend just trying to pass out when I could hear them fooling around. They are talking and whispering when I hear the running thud of footsteps outside of my tent as if something is running at the tent. Then I hear a kind of a pop and drag like something hit the tent and drug against it. My cousin leaps up yelling and now we were all terrified. He is shouting that we need to get out of there right now and we all left everything and ran to his truck. We drove back to the house scared shitless talking about what had just happened and what I saw earlier. As we were all talking about it, we all agreed that the thuds sounded like it had two feet, as you can hear the difference in a deer or horse galloping. They were big thuds, as if it was carrying a lot of weight. My cousin said he was laying near the edge of the teepee when he heard the steps and looked up to see something hit and drag something across the fabric right above him. The fact that he actually was scared is what made it even more frightening to us as he had lived on that land his whole life and had been to that campsite so many times before. I would first like to start off and say sorry in advance for any of my grammar. English is my fourth language, actually, and I know I still have a long road to go to get it perfect. So, to give you a little bit of background information on this story, which is 100% true, by the way, I would like to start with the fact that I'm a European. I posted another story a couple months back about something that happened to me in Tuscany, Italy. As for me and my friends in this story, we are from Spain, and when this happened, at the end of September 2023, we were fairly new to the USA. I moved here a while back for law school, and so did my friends. We had been living here for a few months and decided to explore the nature of this beautiful continent, as we all live in New York City. So, long story short, we decided to go on a road trip to Canada, drive around Lake Ontario, and then drive back to New York City through upstate New York. I am a guy, and my friends were three females. For the sake of anonymity, let's call them Lisa, Anna, and Charlotte. Everything went super smooth until last night. So, for our last night, we had rented an off-grid cabin in a remote area in the woods in upstate New York to give some locals an idea we were like half an hour drive from Harrisburg, I do believe. Me and Lisa had decided to spend one night in this cabin because it was one with nature. The cabin was super old, made from logwood, and there was no running water or electricity. Both me and Lisa had experience with survival in the wild in Europe. I, for myself, had been a Boy Scout my whole life and even was a scout leader for a while. Our other two friends were, as much as I love them, purebred city girls. They had pretty much zero experience with camping or to just be in a place 
where there is no service for their phones, as was the case in this cabin. We had been driving all day to get there, and when we reached the beginning of the forest, it was already past 10 p.m., and it was really dark that night. While driving to this place, we lost internet connection with the GPS, and so I had to drive to that cabin on intuition paired with a good old-fashioned map, hoping for the best while trying to drive safe on these muddy trails. It was also rainy the whole day. On the way there, Anna and Charlotte were in the back of the car, and the moment they lost phone service, they got pretty uneasy for the rest of the ride. All of a sudden, in the pitch-black darkness of the forest, we all saw a campfire, but there were no houses around or people. Just a campfire. A well-organized one, since the fire was not spreading, and it was not as big as a bonfire. It kind of startled all of us that this was a little bit weird since there was no one around it and we were really deep in the forest already. Plus, it was getting very late. When this happened, we also reached the end of the trail and we figured we had taken the wrong trail at a crossroads before. So, I turned around and we were on our way again. Half an hour later and a couple of wrong trails later, we finally had arrived at our destination, as we could finally see the first glimpse of this godforsaken cabin in the middle of nowhere. To give you an idea of how old it was, the potty was made out of wood and was outside the cabin. When we arrived, it was still raining, and both Anna and Lisa were definitely not in the mood for getting out of the car and get in a cabin with zero lights. So, me and Lisa left the lights of the car on and went inside the cabin, while also using our phone flashlights to check the cabin out and see if we could find any old flashlights, which we did, and to see if we could turn on the fireplace, which we didn't because all the wood was still wet from the rain and it seemed no one had prepared dry wood anywhere. So, with a couple of old flashlights and a small improvised fire, I managed to make it in the stove. We all four got in the cabin, and I started to make some pasta for us. Meanwhile, the girls were preparing the beds and closing the windows, since it was already cold in this part of the state. The cabin had a small ladder which led to an elevated room or space with a bed where all three of the girls could fit in and I would sleep downstairs in a bunk bed that seemed older than the First World War. While making pasta, Anna, one of the city girls, came up to me and, knowing that both Lisa and Charlotte did not like to hear anything scary at night, told me that she had seen an old cemetery in the middle of the forest on the way to our cabin, and that she had seen a figure walk around there. I first laughed it off as nothing, as I mentioned in my previous story. I do not consider myself a big believer of scary stuff. Being from Spain, we take promises very serious. To swear on God is very serious for us. And she swore to God that she was not lying. I told her that I believed her, but that there was no need to panic, as I would lock all the doors when we would go to sleep. We had some pasta, managed to make a couple s'mores, which are lovely by the way, and drank a couple of beers, or at least I did. They all had just one. I can assure you that I am not drunk after a couple beers and that I would never start to hallucinate. Just saying in case anyone thinks I saw stuff because of the beer. They all three went to sleep pretty early after finishing the s'mores and their beer, and I considering that I really love the outdoors and that I don't really mind a little bit of rain, decided to take my last beer and a flashlight outside to the front porch, also very old and made of wood, and set myself down with my beer while enjoying the sound of rain and the lovely sight of not seeing a single light in the distance. I could greatly appreciate this coming from New York City, and I just scanned the area around with my flashlight. There was nothing much really to see, besides a lot of trees and a small creek a little further away. 
All I could hear was the wind, the rain, and the running water down in the creek. That was until I suddenly heard what I would describe as a weird roar. The first thing that came to my mind was a bear, but I had researched well before our trip and I knew bears were not common at all in this part of the state. I also know what a bear roar would sound like, and it did not resemble a lot, except for the fact that it was a deep roar, if you get what I mean. Startled, but not really scared, I continued to scan the rest of the forest for as far as I could see from the porch. It was then when my eye caught the glimpse of a figure, well hidden deep into the tree line. I would describe the figure as tall, as I reference, I'm six foot four, and I thought this thing was at least a foot or two higher than me. It was well hidden because it's brown fur. That is what I think it was at least, or the skin in any case, blended in well with the trees in autumn. It was definitely aware of our presence, as I saw two eyes glimpsing into my flashlight. I could not tell you what it was, but I swear to God, that it was not a bear. It was bipedal and had rather long arms, I would say. We looked at each other for what seemed an eternity, but in reality, it was more like five seconds before it vanished behind a tree, and I heard another roar. It was then I felt all of my hair stand up, and I was definitely very much scared. I went inside as quick as I could and locked all doors and closed all curtains. I quickly went to bed and tried to wave it off as just my exhaustion of driving all day, playing tricks on my mind. But I promise you this was very real. After an hour or so, I had calmed down and finally fell asleep. The rest of the night was uneventful, and the next morning, when I went to relieve myself, after having drank beer the night before. The weather had cleared and it was rather sunny, and as far as I could see, the forest was calm and beautiful. No sight of any animal or anything abnormal. We had a nice breakfast that morning and left for our way back to the city that never sleeps. And so ends also my story of that night. I never talked about what I saw that night because I knew all three girls did not like to hear scary stories. And I figured, after these months, that this was the best place to share it. If anyone has an idea of what it could have been, please feel free to enlighten me, especially if it is backed up with rational reasoning. It was early spring 2016. I had just turned 24 years old. My friend and I reached our main spot to camp, Black Canyon Rim Campground, just outside of Payson, Arizona. We'd usually travel out here two or three times each year. It has some incredible views and is only a couple of hours away from the city. For the most part, this area was pretty secluded. A privately owned convenience store rested a few miles away, with a small town 20 miles before that. The entrance was on a dirt road directly off the highway, with a campground sign at the start of the road, marking local wildlife, any fire hazards, and general news relevant to camping folk. The pathing is mostly linear, with maybe one fork spanning several miles. We once traveled down the dirt road to see how far it would take us. One of the paths would take you to another highway entrance, with a ranger's tower halfway there. The other path led to a dead end. An abandoned cabin can be found on this path a few miles in, mostly hidden off in the distance behind some larger foliage. The snow had mostly cleared up at this point, leaving for crisp air a slight chill and fauna becoming active again. We'd usually spot some wild horses, several deer, and tons of little critters whenever we'd come out this way. It really was the perfect time of year for a relaxing trip to get away from the city for a few days. 
We got in at around 4 p.m. on a Tuesday. It was late for us, as we'd usually try to make it out there by noon at the latest. This trip was pretty spontaneous. We both had work during the coming weekend and decided to just go for it. The sun was setting fast and we still hadn't picked our spot to camp out yet. There were maybe two other groups, both families, parked somewhat close to the entrance, only a few hundred yards away from the highway. This time around, we just wanted to get away from humans for a while. Customer service jobs will do that to you. We drove down the dirt road, past our usual spot, and finally picked the perfect area. A small clearing, just hanging off the edge of a hill. The whole valley could be seen from this area, with a beautiful sunset. This would have been our main spot from then on, if the next night's incident never happened, that is. We agreed to get a campfire going and would just avoid building a tent this trip. We didn't have much time to do so anyway, and her car wasn't that uncomfortable. I'd sleep in the back seat, and she'd take the passenger seat with the window slightly ajar. We have a few blankets for each of us, and would fall asleep into the unrivaled slumber. The next day went fairly uneventful. We just decompressed. I had the strange feeling throughout the day, though, like we were being watched. There was crunching of leaves just out of sight every few hours, but I figured it was just the local wildlife doing their thing. My friend didn't notice anything unusual, so I didn't dwell on it. Night came, and the feeling still hadn't gone away. My friend must have felt something she didn't vocalize, though. She took some of her sleeping pills. She didn't usually need them on our camping trips. The nature's ambience was enough to put anyone to sleep, I thought. It was nearing 1 a.m. My friend dozed off into the passenger seat while I attempted to wind down in the back. I leaned against the side window behind the passenger seat, legs outstretched to the car's back door. The window opposite of me was rowed down slightly, with a cool breeze flowing in. I had been on my phone scrolling through Facebook or whatever when I heard something outside. A few crunches of the fallen leaves, several paces outside the car. I whispered to my friend, Did you hear that? But she was already out. I put my phone down, and I listened intently for a minute or two. Nothing. It must have been a small animal, curious of the camp. I went back to my phone, scrolling through whatever social media. About ten minutes had passed when I heard it again. Crunch. Right outside the door. I lowered my phone. My eyes took a moment to adjust from the light of the phone into the deep dark of the woods. As I turned the phone away from me, the back light illuminated the window above my feet. To this day, I can't get the image out of my head. Two dirty, scabbed hands held onto the window. The fingers wrapped inside the car. The nails were long, unkept, and dark. Behind the window, a silhouette of a face was pressed up against it. The breath would create condensation every few seconds. All I could make out were the reflections of those empty, black eyes. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. It felt like eternity. The staring contest between us and this thing. Thoughts were repeating incessantly in my head. Why haven't they ran away when they saw that I noticed them? What were they planning? Is this the face of death? After probably ten seconds of not doing anything, the hands slowly unclenched the window and receded into the darkness. The condensation on the window dispersed. Another couple seconds passed before I heard the dreaded crunch, 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 melodically fading into the distance. I still just sat there. 
What in the fuck just happened? Why didn't I do anything? Why am I still not doing anything? And with that thought, my body shot into adrenaline mode. I pounded on my friend's seat, waking her up from her slumber into a dizzy confusion. I unlatched and kicked open the back door and took a moment to scan the area. Whoever they were, whatever it was, it was gone. I scrambled to pick up any important camping supplies we left outside and just crammed everything into the back seat in the trunk, periodically looking over my shoulder, listening for those footsteps. I slammed the back door shut, and there they were, a grim reminder of the horror that had just happened. Two handprints imprinted on the window. I quickly wiped them off the window in a panic. A reaction to erase the event, I guess. I jumped into the front seat, started the car, and floored it out of there. My friend, finally coming to, asked me what the hell I was doing. We gotta go, I said. There's someone out there. I didn't see whatever or whoever it was while fleeing the scene. Speeding down the dirt road, my friend insisted that I slow down. And I eventually did. We reached the highway, and I proceeded to drive 20 or so miles before we reached a Denny's where my friend asked for us to stop so we could eat and for me to explain everything. The nightmare subsided a few months later. My embarrassment continues to this day for the state of shock I was in at the time. Everybody says you either have a fight or flight instinct, and I'm confused whether I have either. I mean, I just sat there and did nothing. I frequently tend to ask myself who was out there. Another camper messing with us? A resident of the abandoned cabin down the dirt road? Or maybe something more paranormal residing in the forest, watching lone, vulnerable campers as they drift off to dreamland? We'd still go camping there in the years ahead, but never too far from the highway. Whatever it was, I hope that was the last I've seen of it. I have always been an avid mountain person. When people say they go to the beach for vacation, I respect it, but I prefer the mountains 100%. Something about these old giants has always fascinated me, as if I just cannot avoid but to be drawn towards them and be in awe when hiking on them. Over my short life, a 21-year-old college student, I consider that I have seen a fair amount of mountain ranges in Europe, from the Alps in Switzerland to the Pyrenees in Spain and from the Italian Dolomite to the Czech Stolaway Mountains. I have always hiked and camped outdoors a lot with friends and family, but also by myself. Now, I went to the United States for college, and I have always been tempted to do a part of the Appalachian Trail. From the pictures I saw on the internet, I always wanted to see them in person, and not gonna lie, I must say that the great amount of scary stories of these mountains also attracted me a little bit as well. I am definitely not a person who likes scary movies or anything, but I enjoy reading fellow mountaineer experiences, and to be honest, I mostly just read stories about the Appalachian Trail to know how to prepare myself for when I was going to do it. The scary stories just got my attention every now and a while. That being said, I decided to go to it this year and do a small part of the Appalachian Trail. I went to do a small part between the borders of Tennessee and North Carolina, with Clingman's Dome being the icing on the cake. I was a little bit hesitant to go by myself, since I'm not very familiar with both the geography as well as the wildlife in this part of the state. I wanted to go with a friend or my girlfriend who was from North Carolina herself, but both my friend, who was from Germany, as my girlfriend declined because 
they had to work. I had spring break. So I decided I'll just go by myself since I am graduating this year and will return back to Europe. I started at this place called Bryson City and walked along the Tuscasegee River until I reached the Nolan Creek Trailhead. From there on, I just followed the trail until I would reach Clingman's Dome. And from Clingman's Dome, I would follow the Appalachian Trail for about a week. I had prepared well for this trip. I carried bear spray and pepper spray. I read some freaky stories about people in the Appalachian Trail. And I also brought this hunting knife and axe for wood, of course. I had some canned food and lots of water, plus a water filter. And for the rest, just my tent and sleeping bag. So, when I started walking away from Bryson City, I then saw the beautiful aurora this mountain range had. I couldn't be happier. I had been wanting to do this since I had arrived here in the U.S., and I was finally doing it. I encountered some people on the Nolan Creek Trailhead who were very friendly, but I had made up my mind that I would be better off alone than with strangers. I reached Klingman's Dome the same day and went a little further before I would set camp. It was beautiful. At night, I slept a bit off the trail with a small campfire while I had dinner and which I put out before I went to sleep. The first night went super well. As I also was exhausted from the hike to Klingman's Dome, the next two days were just as beautiful and I saw lots of breathtaking views. The people on the Appalachian Trail I encountered were super polite as well. Then, at the third night, I feel like everything took a strange turn. I had set up my camp just as usual, around 160 feet from the trail. No one was camping close to me, or at least that I was aware of. While getting dinner, I just had this super weird gut feeling that I was not alone there. I felt like as if someone was looking at me from behind a tree or something like that. I tried to just convince myself that I was having an amazing time and that I was safe and that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I went to sleep and put out the fire as usual. Then, before it was daylight again, I woke up. I woke up with the same gut feeling that even though I was in my tent, Someone was watching my tent from a distance. I did not hear a single bird, which was weird, because right before daylight is when they start chirping again. I only heard the wind and the leaves. It made me feel really uncomfortable, a bit scared even. I didn't fall back asleep again, and first thing in the morning, after having breakfast in my tent, I broke up camp and decided to continue my hike. During my hike, I encountered a few more people, and again, they were very nice, but I stick to myself. While walking on this part of the trail by myself alone, I felt being observed again. I even had the feeling as if something or someone was following me. So, every now and then, I would stop dead in my tracks in order to hear if it was real. Now. Obviously, my mind could be playing tricks on me, but I would swear that I heard the steps stop a second after I had stopped. So, according to me at that moment, someone was definitely following me. I looked around me the whole time, and I never saw someone or something, which made it even more weird. After the long day of hiking, I made camp this time closer to the trail than usual, because for some reason, I thought it would be more safe. I again had this gut feeling of being watched while having dinner outside my tent. So I decided to finish it up in my tent and went to the bathroom in a bottle because I did not want to go outside, at least not now. I tried to sleep by closing my eyes, but my mind just focused on hearing the whole time. And that is when I heard it for the first time. 
a knock, as if a branch was hitting a tree or a small rock was getting thrown at a tree. Silence followed for what seemed an eternity, but probably only ten minutes. Then again, this time more clear. I was scared now, and I had no idea where to go, since it was dark already. I put on my flashlight in the tent and made myself as big as I could so that my shadow outside the tent looked bigger because of the light. I don't know why this was my reasoning at the time. I just thought of bears. And I held my hunting knife in my hand. The silence had followed the second knock, but now I shouted to pierce the silence in the dark. First, I shouted that whoever was joking around, I was armed and I was not wanting to be pranked. I thought this would scare them off. It didn't. It was almost as if this person found it even more funny knowing I was pissed at them. I heard another knock, and immediately after a knock on what I assumed to be the opposite side of my tent. So now I'm guessing it was two people instead of one, and that they liked to pull a prank on an innocent passerby. I tried to stay up as long as I could, but at around 4 a.m. my eyes just gave up and I dwelled off. I woke up at around 8 a.m., again with the light of the sun being my savior. I first tried to hear if whoever was pranking me was still knocking. I did not hear anything. I shouted again, stating that I was now going to exit my tent with my knife in my hand and that whoever had been joking around should make themselves known. I walked out of my tent, and I did not see anyone. I looked for tracks around my camp, but could not immediately make something out of it. I decided to get the hell out of there. The next part of my week basically continued being the same. At night, I'd hear some knocks from different directions, and occasionally I heard what I would guess was a little bit of humming like as if a person was just humming a tune. Now, I never saw anyone except for the occasional hikers on the Appalachian Trail, so I cannot say I saw something weird, but I never shook out of this weird gut feeling of being observed and followed during the rest of my hike on the Appalachian Trail. I am now back and commented this to my girlfriend. She says it was probably my mind playing tricks on me and I am willing to believe her because I never saw anything. But I still sometimes wake up in the middle of the night thinking I am in that tent in the middle of nowhere and someone is watching and knocking on a tree. And every time I wake up like this, the thought alone scares me. I grew up hiking and camping in Maritime, Canada, and I've had a few close calls with animals. The first time, I was around 14 and was fishing with my dad on a hot, late summer day. We didn't have any luck after around an hour, so we packed our gear and headed up the hill we came down to get to the creek. As we ascended the hill, suddenly a large black bear broke through the brush at around 30 feet ahead of us, stood up and looked at us, then started running full tilt towards us. We started yelling and waving our arms as the bear bore down upon us at speed. I was sure we were about to be mauled when it was around 10 feet from us, when it turned off to the left and ran away. My second close call, I was 16, solo camping on a cold moonlit night in December so winter camping. That's probably what saved me. I was crouching, tending my fire when I felt something watching me, and I knew I wasn't alone. I then heard something run up rapidly behind me, cracking the ice crust on the snow from around 15 feet away. I jumped up and turned around, and I yelled in primal rage like I never have before and I heard whatever it was run back 
where it came from and off to the side. And then I heard cracking coming from a distance on my other side. That's when I decided I was leaving and ditching most of my gear. I wore the pack out to provide back protection if something jumped on me. When I came back the next day, I knew what the tracks were as soon as I saw them. Koi wolf. In eastern Canada, the coyotes are much larger and more aggressive as they interbred with wolves. My third encounter, I was four-wheeling when I rounded a corner and there was a cow moose. It raised all of the fur on its back and took a couple steps towards the four-wheeler when I revved the engine and then deterred it. Honestly, from my experience, humans are more dangerous though. Never had to deploy bear spray on any animal yet, but once it saved me from a person. I was hammock camping and I noticed that there was a homeless looking guy watching me from the bushes around 30 feet away. And I yelled over and asked him what he was doing and told him I wasn't comfortable and wanted them to move along. He came up enraged. I dare ask him to move along and he pulled a little hatchet thing and he was pretty much yelling incoherent shit and waving it around. I then pulled the spray and doused him with the entire can and then got the fuck out of there. The spray got me a little, but my eyes were only watering. The guy was incapacitated and wasn't a threat anymore. He was screaming and grabbing his face and would walk around 10 feet, wipe at his face a bit, and then walk again. Needless to say, I got the hell away from that guy and enjoyed the rest of my trip. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true backwoods creepy stories. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Innerscare, Sugared Spite, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Glimco, Chrissy Elias, Tina Mead, Cindy, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Les Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank each and every last one of you for your continued support of Back to Ashes. Because of people like you, if I did not have a supportive audience, I would not have a voice. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.